Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Mapping Cell States from Single Cell Gene Expression Data, presented by G.C. Young, N.D., Associate Professor at the Department of Biostatistics and Computational Biology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Julie Simaroth of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the lower left corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yuan. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Uh, thank you, Julie, for the introduction. Uh, thank you. I'd like to first thank uh, Labroots for the opportunity to present our work uh, here and uh, thank the audience for participating. So our work uh, I'm going to present today is about the single cell analysis. When we look at uh, the uh, universe, uh, we think this is infinitely complicated and we worship it and we studied it and make stories about them. But uh, actually, every one of us, there is an internal universe we compose of the many, many cells. In fact, the cells we have in our body is much more than the number of the galaxies in the universe. Over the years, many people have uh, studied the uh, uh, tissues and the cells inside us, of course. And we know that uh, our uh, body composes of itself various the tissues and the cell types. And uh, roughly speaking, these cells can be organized into this uh, hierarchy. And starting from the top, which is the uh, self renewal uh, stem cells, which undergoes this uh, series of this differentiation that become these the terminally differentiated cells, which uh, usually carries out uh, these uh, everyday functions. Each of the cell types have its own function and its own morphology. And uh, the very beginning way people start to recognize these uh, kind of the cell types is uh, through really looking at these cells at the microscopic level. And they actually, this is the one of the earliest uh, figure I took from uh, the famous uh, neurobiologist uh, uh, Kaha, who uh, actually uh, used a handwritten drawing uh, these uh, pictures of the neurons and he identified these different uh, subclasses of these uh, neurons. And as you can imagine that this way of the annotation is not only labor intensive, but it's also is subject to, to a lot of these uh, human error. In the modern days, the um, people started to realize the uh, power to use the molecular signatures to identify these uh, the cell types. And perhaps it is one of the most uh, well-defined cellular hierarchies in the hematopoietic systems. And the seminal work by the Dr. Irvin uh, Weissman's lab from Stanford over the years and many, many other people that have constructed this uh, full um, the uh, uh, lineage tree in the hematopoietic systems, uh, mainly based on the ability that they can purify and uh, sort the cells based on these um, so-called the, the cell surfix uh, uh, markers. And uh, that's the kind of the uh, tools that uh, people used uh, uh, in their labs uh, almost uh, every single day. But that's the tools, nonetheless, still contain a lot of ambiguity, as I will show 
a little bit uh, later. So uh, in the past few years, there's a set of these new tools uh, emerges uh, called the single cell uh, uh, technology. And what it does is that uh, they can use uh, the, either the PCR or the RAC, mass time tree, and all of these tools, and they can actually they quantify this uh, transcription level or the protein level at a single cell resolution. And with that information, people have been equipped with this uh, most powerful tools trying to identify the cell types. They can uh, develop, uh, identify this development of shank trace. Uh, they identify these uh, uh, heterogeneity inside diseases, and so on and so forth. And when we started this uh, uh, several years ago, we applied this uh, single cell technology to re-examine the cellular hierarchy inside this uh, hematopoietic system. And this is done by the uh, qPCR uh, technology. Uh, we look at the mouse uh, system. We are uh, looking at uh, the expression level of this uh, 280 uh, common cell suffix markers expression level in about uh, 1,500 single cells. And what you can see first is that uh, these cells indeed group into these big clusters of uh, like what they expected. But uh, within each of the cell group, then you look at them closely, and actually you do see there's uh, quite a bit of the heterogeneity. And what that suggests is that uh, these uh, 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 common uh, uh, tool using this uh, fact sorting technique is uh, uh, not capable of identifying these uh, subtle differences among these individual cell types. So what I'm going to tell you today is about uh, uh, our work in the past few years to develop the several computational methods trying to analyze this uh, single cell data and um, the, uh, to characterize the, the cell types, the dynamics, and the, the lineages. And I will go into these uh, the, in more details. The first method is called the uh, Gini class. The goal of that is trying to identify the stress cell types. This work was led by a uh, very talented postdoc called Langell. And we are very motivated by these uh, uh, rapid uh, growth in the scale of the single cell analysis. As you can see in this figure, during the past few years, the number of the cells that become profiled by the single cell technology almost grows exponentially. And just very recently, the 10x genomics have released a, a big data set that contains about 1.3 million single cells uh, from the uh, most uh, uh, the brain systems. And uh, it will be really, really interesting trying to understand among these data sets, are there any cell types that are not previously known before? And uh, that is kind of the dream in the single cell uh, bi uh, biology. So the kind of the question to identify these single cells is kind of the very similar to identify a rare person inside these uh, uh, populations. So you and I are looking at this picture we probably would uh, immediately focus there is a person wearing red in the middle. And from that regard, we'll probably call him as a rare individual. But if you think about it, the way that we actually can identify these rare individuals from this population is by no means a trivial task. Because this person not only looks just about the same as everyone else, and his, also his dress is like everything else. So how do we know? Especially, how do you tell a computer to know that we should examine the specific feature, which is red, to distinguish from this person to the rest? So if you are a, a statistician, then of course the first uh, approach you want to take is that to look at the uh, distribution of expression of uh, genes in these uh, uh, cell populations. But the if, you, if a gene uh, is really expressed in the very, very small number of the cells, then the expression pattern, uh, the distribution will look something like this, where you have this huge peak around the zero, and then you have a, almost a very negligible peak that's uh, at this high uh, expression level corresponding to the rare cells. And the traditional way of the uh, 
uh, analyzing these uh, uh, genes is by using these variants that will be uh, unable to identify these uh, genes because the uh, gene expression in only one or two cells, it would have almost a negligible effect on the global variance. So this problem we have been thinking about for a long time. And then we come the um, stimulation by, from reading these literature in economics. So there is a very well-defined uh, statistics in the social economic study. It's called the Gini index, which is often used to, to uh, discover the um, uh, uneven uh, income inequality around the world. Right. So we adopted this uh, concept uh, trying to uh, s identify the rare cell types uh, specific genes. The idea is the following. So if you take every gene and then you sort its expression pattern among the cells from the lowest to the highest and then on the y-axis you look at the total amount of the transcription that a represented by this uh, set of the uh, cells. Then what you see is initially a very flat curve, and then in the end, it will start to uh, grow up if the expression level is only present in a small number of the cells. However, if the cell, if the gene expression is evenly distributed across the cell types, then you will essentially see a uh, diagonal line. Therefore, the area between this diagonal line and uh, this uh, red curve will give you a good measurement for the inequality of this uh, uh, gene expression. So this is the key uh, feature uh, to select these genes. And uh, then we add a number of the additional steps, uh, such as normalization, and uh, the density-based clustering. And so we put together a comprehensive pipeline. We call it the GD class, they're trying to identify the rare cell types. And uh, this uh, uh, paper was recently published. And then we also have a software that uh, uh, can be run as uh, both as a web application and also a command line application. So just to uh, uh, give you a, a kind of a sense how well this method works, then we kind of uh, used this uh, validation experiments where we mixed uh, a, uh, in this um, uh, bone marrow cells uh, from the mouse uh, with a small number of the cells from the different lineages. One of that is the intestine stem cells marked by red, and the other one is the uh, memory stem cells marked by blue. And what we want to know is that uh, can we use the Gini class to, to recover these uh, uh, populations? And uh, the uh, and you can see that uh, the uh, uh, the truth here's the truth on the on the left that is are the two uh, populations, and on the right we see the results uh, that uh, uh, discovered by the uh, Gini class. And then we see indeed there's a very high uh, correspondence between the two and uh, showing that the Gini index indeed uh, performed very well in uh, identifying rare populations. So uh, of course, uh, we are very eager to apply this technology to analyzing the real challenging data sets. And one of the data sets was um, published about two years ago using the technology in the in-job. So what this does is uh, to look at the undifferentiated ER cells uh, to quantify uh, about uh, uh, 2,500 of these cells and uh, uh, identify the gene expression patterns in every one of them. So by using the Gini class, what we found was this teeny little bit of the rare cluster marked by red which can only be clearly visible when you zoom in this fashion. And uh, we only identify this single rare cluster. So we want to know, is it really real or just a technical artifact? So here's a slide where I show that which genes that are actually differentially expressed between these uh, uh, rare cell types, uh, rare cell clusters, and the rest of the cells. And you can see there's this number of the genes that uh, uh, associated with the Z scan family, and also this gene called the TCS, TV1. All of these genes actually 
they are known to be highly expressed uh, in this two cell stage, which unlike this uh, traditional ES cells, they possess uh, these uh, uh, total potency uh, properties, suggesting that among this um, uh, big population of the ES cells, there might exist a small fraction of these uh, uh, cells that uh, may possess this additional uh, uh, differentiation potential. So we thought that's quite interesting uh, discovery. Now let me just uh, switch the gears a little bit and talk about another method that we call this a SCUBA. And the goal here is trying to model dynamics during the start differentiation. The work was done by uh, a former postdoc, uh, Eugenio Marco. So the main idea is that when we start to think about these uh, cell states, we tend to think that the cell states are uh, fixed. But in reality, the, actually the cell states are constantly uh, uh, changing, right? So to find out the dynamics uh, of the gene expressions is actually is the key to understand uh, the functions of uh, these uh, uh, cell states. And in the mathematics, uh, there is uh, a, a very nice representation uh, in this called this uh, phase uh, diagram. So what I show is uh, the uh, expression level of uh, uh, two genes, A and B. And you can imagine this is actually, uh, there are uh, about uh, 20,000 dimensions that you cannot see, whereas each of these dot it represents uh, a uh, expression level uh, for uh, a single cell. And you can see in this picture, there is a big circle uh, that's kind of like the center, uh, we call it a tractor. So what it does is that uh, if a cell that's uh, actually uh, away from that, and that tend to be attracted to, to this data. So uh, that's the uh, why we call this center as this uh, uh, attractor. And uh, you can actually uh, intuitively uh, imagine this is the same as uh, this uh, uh, pattern where you throw a ball uh, down this uh, uh, kind of uh, valley whereas uh, the attractor corresponds to the bottom of the valley, whereas the cells on the side uh, correspond to these uh, uh, cells on the uh, slopes. So uh, you can also appreciate the fact that uh, if you perturb this uh, uh, valley landscape a little bit by nudging a little bit at the bottom, then instead of having one attractor, you could have uh, two attractors, one on the left and the other one on the right. And when you do that, uh, you will see that actually there are two attractors on the left, and actually uh, they separated by uh, boundary space. So, um, I need to take a little break. Is that okay? So, we want to <laughs> apply this. Um, idea to analyze the real single cell data. So ideally, what you want is to follow the gene expression patterns along the cell, in live cells as they differentiate. But uh, in actually in the reality, what you, you can only do is uh, to take a snapshots at the different time points of uh, these uh, uh, developmental paths. And by uh, what actually analyze one of these data sets uh, uh, in the mouse or embryo, and uh, the, uh, we identify these uh, kind of uh, uh, developmental uh, lineages uh, with uh, these uh, two uh, branching points that you can see. Uh, these uh, we call this as the um, bifurcation uh, points, where uh, one homogeneous population becomes uh, uh, two uh, heterogeneous populations. So we particularly focus on these uh, two uh, directions uh, where these uh, two uh, cell types uh, diverge, and we call this uh, the um, bifurcation direction. If you project these uh, um, high-dimensional gene expression data sets on this uh, uh, bifurcation direction, then what you would see is something like this, okay? Uh, consistent with the fact that you have one homogeneous populations becoming uh, two uh, distinct uh, uh, populations. This is uh, at the uh, 16 cells uh, bifurcation. This is at the uh, 32 cell uh, bifurcation. Uh, 
And to model these dynamic changes across along this uh, uh, bifurcation axis, so you use this uh, uh, mathematical model uh, for, first discovered by uh, Rene Tom, in, a mathematician uh, in the 60s. So uh, you can look at the, this uh, uh, graph where at the bottom that shows these two parameter space, A and B. And uh, the y-axis shows uh, for each of this configuration uh, how many steady states, that, uh, steady states you see. So uh, if you're in this, uh, uh, in this kind of conic, uh, the blue area, then there are actually uh, three uh, steady states. Uh, one of them is unstable, and the other two are uh, stable. These are the tractors that you see, whereas uh, on these uh, uh, green regions, you only see uh, one steady state, so that's the uh, stable states. So the kind of bifurcation uh, uh, area that you see earlier that correspond to these uh, 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 movement uh, from this blue, uh, green zone to this uh, uh, blue zone. So uh, to uh, uh, mimic the fact that there is actually a stochastic noise in the system, we add a uh, noise term in these uh, equations. And uh, the uh, distribution of the cells actually can be uh, 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 written uh, by this uh, focal planck equation that actually has analytical uh, solutions to that. So if you apply this model to the data sets I showed you before, then you have this nice looking this, uh, uh, potential. Uh, again, uh, you see this is kind of one valley uh, at the uh, before the bifurcation that change into these two valleys after this bifurcation. So you may wonder, uh, why do you care about uh, this kind of the uh, process? So one of the reasons that we think you may care is because it makes a specific predictions about uh, which kind of uh, regulators would lead to an imbalance uh, in these uh, differentiation uh, CL lineages. So uh, imagine that uh, uh, when you're in this uh, uh, previous slide, uh, imagine that if you're depending on where you are, on this uh, uh, slope, on the valley, then you may have a higher or lower probability that the falling to the uh, valley in the left, and the valley in the right. And uh, based on the model that gives you a quantitative prediction of the effect of the, every one of these character, uh, trans uh, transfer factors, which is shown over here. And actually, we can experimentally test these predictions. The way we did that is that uh, used these uh, uh, mass mutant uh, of the NANOC uh, which uh, uh, have uh, uh, both uh, some of the uh, embryos has this uh, homozygous uh, knockout, and some of them have uh, heterozygous knockout, and some of them even have uh, you know just like well type. Each of the row is uh, a a uh, uh, embryo, and each of the column is a gene. So by fitting our model to this data, and you can actually see that uh, the our model. Uh, can uh, roughly speaking predict uh, the bias that's introduced uh, by these nanog perturbations, whereas uh, the using just the nanog expression alone, it does a very, very poor job that's uh, making this uh, kind of prediction. Another kind of prediction that we thought was very interesting but has yet to be uh, experimentally validated is the effect of the noise. Right? Noise is, people, many people think that's a noise. It's intrinsically, it's a deleterious uh, uh, effect. But uh, there are some studies also suggest that uh, the noise could have um, an important biological functions. And in this case, what we predict is that uh, uh, the uh, magnitude of the noise actually could influence the balance of these different lineages. If you have a very little noise, then preferentially most of the cells, they will be located in one of the two outcomes. Whereas if they're too big of the noise, then they will tend to be more uniformly distributed. And it is possible that the noise level is also subjected into uh, the model control. So uh, let me just uh, talk briefly about uh, our ongoing um, our work uh, on uh, Ariadne. Uh, so this goal is trying to uh, reconstruct uh, the developmental uh, trajectories without prior uh, temporal information. This work was led by uh, talented graduate students, uh, Hui Dong Chen and a postdoc, uh, Lu Kak Niao. 
So uh, I would just uh, describe how it works uh, using a kind of uh, uh, examples uh, just to give you a better idea. So here we re-examine this uh, uh, qPCR data uh, in the bones, uh, bone marrow, mouse bone marrow, and uh, uh, each of the dot represents itself. So uh, we started with the high dimensional gene expression data and we projected uh, into a low dimensional space by using this uh, local linear uh, embedding uh, uh, technology. And then the next step we do is uh, to um, identify the clusters inside the, these uh, cells and to connect these clusters by using this uh, meaningless spanning tree. And uh, that gives you a uh, lineage representation of uh, these uh, cell types. Now, uh, this still quite uh, uh, not so intuitive uh, how the, uh, 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 the developmental trajectory progresses. So to aid the visualization, we actually uh, plot a, a two-dimensional uh, tree. We call this a planar tree, whereas uh, these, uh, each of the branches represents uh, a uh, kind of developmental lineage um, uh, inferred by the uh, minimum spanning tree, whereas uh, the, uh, each of uh, the uh, 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 the distance between uh, a cell to the branch, and uh, that represents uh, the uh, how uh, the certainty that that cell is uh, uh, mapped to that uh, uh, branch. And from here, what you can see is that uh, we start from the uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, becoming the uh, pot uh, potent uh, uh, stem cells, and uh, then uh, in one of the lineages, you become this uh, MEPs. And in some other lineages, you go to the other lineages. So that's completely assistant uh, with uh, our known um, biology. What uh, we could also uh, show is uh, the uh, distribution of the cells at each of these uh, uh, points along this tree. And uh, uh, this gives you a kind of uh, uh, a quality information about where the uh, development of bottleneck is, for example. You see that uh, in this uh, uh, first bifurcation, there is a vast uh, uh, degree of these uh, uh, cells. That suggests that uh, perhaps the uh, cells, uh, the uh, very, very few cells that actually stayed at uh, these states. So we could also look at the, this individual uh, gene markers on this tree, and especially we can identify there are some markers that are uh, differentially expressed between uh, the different lineages, and that may suggest that these uh, uh, genes may play a distinct role in the make the cell fate uh, decisions. So, uh, just to summarize what I uh, talked to you about today, uh, I told you uh, three uh, methods our lab developed. And the first is called a genie class. It's a method trying to identify the rare cell types. And the second method is the scuba. Uh, is trying to uh, model the dynamics of the gene expression during cell differentiation. And the last one is called the iridine. And it, it's uh, not only uh, reconstruct the cell images, but also the visualizes the biology uh, during the cell uh, differentiation. And uh, it, last but not least, uh, let me thank the people who have done the work. Uh, the uh, Lanjiang uh, led the work in developing these uh, gene class methods. Uh, Eugenio led the work in the scuba. Uh, Luca and Hui Dong uh, led the work in the Eridini. And a lot of these experimental work uh, were done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Stuart Orkin's labs, uh, specifically uh, Guo Ji Guo, who was uh, a former postdoc in the lab. And then we also thank our uh, funding agencies for the support. And finally, I will thank everybody for uh, paying attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for that informative presentation. Thank you, Dr. Yan, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. 
Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we can. Let's get started. The first question is, are the tools publicly available? Are public available and posted uh, both at our uh, uh, website and also we post uh, the tools at the GitHub, which is open source uh, uh, depository for all the uh, software. Thank you. The next question is, what is the difference between cell states and cell types? Very uh, interesting question. Very, uh, so that's actually, uh, there's a lot of um, debate in the community, uh, what you call a cell state, what you call a cell type, and uh, there is not a consensus, uh, actually. So it's basically a, a, a very, um, uh, intuitive way to think about it is that, that the uh, uh, cell states is, a, is a more or less a continuous representation uh, of the uh, uh, gene expression, whereas the cell type is a more uh, discretized version of the, uh, 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 of the description. So what I uh, tend to uh, uh, think of uh, is kind of my uh, kind of favorite thought was that uh, uh, the cell types are kind of like the uh, attractors that you see in one of the slides that showed before. So it's uh, intrinsically stable. If you perturb a little bit away from that, then we'll turn back to that. So uh, that's um, uh, perhaps uh, you know highly regulated by underlying gene expression, uh, gene regulatory networks. But uh, the uh, cell states uh, uh, can be you know the uh, cloud that uh, around it, so it's uh, uh, intrinsically uh, stochastic, but uh, uh, only if, a, uh, if it's stable, then uh, I would like to call them as a uh, cell type. Yeah, that's a very good question. Any additional questions will be answered via email after the presentation. I would like to once again thank Dr. Yang for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labroots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August of 2017. You will receive an email from Labroots letting you know when the, this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.